This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, believe it or not, we're about halfway through with our course, and I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are. Uh, working with you. Uh, as I've introduced myself before, my name is Bobby Barron. I'm one of the co-chairs of this course and also director of the uh, UCSF Osher Mini Medical School. And we're very pleased that you're here tonight. Um, today we're going to talk about the skin, and there are very few people at UCSF who are more experienced with this. Uh, our speaker, Lindy Fox, is an outstanding uh, outpatient uh, a dermatologist. He's patients uh, personally in her office uh, here at UCSF, uh, but also has for many years led our inpatient uh, dermatology consultation service, which means that Lindy gets to see about the sickest patients we have, because when you have the combination of serious medical illnesses and a serious skin disease, uh, it's often a, a very serious combination. Lindy is also an outstanding teacher working with our medical students and residents, but particularly our dermatology residents, and has also founded one of our uh, most uh, innovative fellowships for advanced training in dermatology. Uh, so I think you're in for a, a terrific uh, evening. Um, uh, you'll find this extremely useful. Uh, I'm sure quite personal, because we all have spots. Uh, we've entitled the talk, Skin Lesions and Cancers, When is a Spot More Than a Spot? And also, what about sunscreens? <laughs> Welcome, Lindy. Thank you, Bobby, for the very um, generous introduction. I'm very excited to be with you here this evening. I wanted to arm you with um, some dermatology knowledge about things that are really common and nothing to worry about, and then other skin lesions that are indicative of something more concerning. And then I wanted to brief, uh, briefly go through the treatments that we use so that if you or a loved one or just are interested in what happens when a diagnosis of one of these spots is made, then what's the next step? We'll go through that as well. And then we'll spend some time on sunscreen because I think there's not enough education on sunscreens. Um, sprinkled in there will be some myths um, that are popular, but maybe um, some truths to uh, counter those myths. And we will go through um, some common benign skin lesions. We'll go through non-melanoma skin <coughs> cancers. We'll talk about melanoma as well. Um, and we'll talk about um, and we'll talk about basal, uh, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma in there. So we're gonna start with some common skin lesions. I'm gonna ask if we can dim the lights just a little bit because dermatology is all about visualization and I want you guys to see the details of the things we're talking about. But some common skin lesions that um, pretty much 100% of us in the room will have um, at least one if not two of these um, that I think are worth knowing about that do bring people to my office because they're concerned about them but are very um, benign and nice to be able to reassure people they don't need to worry about them. So we'll talk about seborrheic keratoses, dermatofibromas, cherry angiomas, pyogenic granulomas, chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis, <laughs> and sebaceous hyperplasia. And it's not my fault these are the names of these things and they're hard to remember and they're confusing and sometimes sound similar to each other. It's just the way it goes. All right, so seborrheic keratoses. These are the things that appear on most commonly our trunk and extremities, mostly the proximal extremities. They are often brown and very warty in texture. They grow and appear after usually age 40 and up. So it often brings somebody into my office saying, I have a new growth, it's brown, it's irregular, this is what you told me to watch out for, so here I am. Um, but I'm happy, happy to be able to reassure patients that it's nothing. So how can I help you recognize um, a seborrheic keratosis? So they have a stuck-on appearance, almost like somebody decided to pick it up and just stick it on top of the skin. They have a plateau-like configuration, and that is very sharp when things begin and, and end. They are warty, but also can be um, a little bit greasy or waxy looking. And they can be very small or ranging large. And in dermatology, large is around two centimeters. Small is around half, half a centimeter. 
And they like to be in areas um, on the trunk, predominantly upper abdomen, lower chest. So they're really common under the bra strap um, in the, on the chest. They're really common all throughout the back and often appear um, on the lower abdomen, groin area, and proximal uh, arms and legs, so thighs, deltoid area. And this is what a seborrheic keratosis looks like. So I'm sort of I'm going to walk you through um, the details. So there's these are all seborrheic keratoses. There's a cherry angioma sitting off here to the left, which we can talk about later. But these all have a stuck-on appearance to them. They're warty in texture. They're kind of dry and almost start to get crumbly. And sometimes they look like they're going to just fall right off. And sometimes they do. They can get irritated, in which case they become red or itchy or hurt. And they become very inflamed. But most of the time, they just sit there. The way we, what, we, what I sometimes refer to, them to, uh, refer to them as is barnacles of maturity. Because <laughs> they're kind of barnacle-like. I didn't make that up either. Here's a close-up view. You can kind of get a sense of that warty texture. So melanomas uh, don't make this overlying scaly warty change on the top. And that's one of the things that helps reassure me that I'm not looking at a melanoma. Here are some more adherent seborrheic keratoses. Now, if you have a bunch of skin lesions that are all identical to each other and distributed widely throughout the body, it's highly unlikely that any of those are going to be bad, because you don't make eruptive bad things like that all at once as a healthy person. It just doesn't happen. So it's reassuring if you can find that these, this skin lesion matches that skin lesion matches that skin lesion, even though they might be slightly different, you can get a sense that they're almost all um, have similar features, so they become sort of uniform in their appearance. Uh, hopefully, you can all identify that off here to the periphery are different skin lesions. So, so don't get caught up in that, because we'll go over what those are. Pay attention to the warty texture. You can get a really clear sense of where things begin and end. Yes, there's variation in color, but that overlying texture and that stuck-on appearance tells you it's a seborrheic keratosis. So they should start to all begin to look the same. And that, and that way, you begin to recognize the pattern. And dermatology is all really about pattern recognition. So again, you, you're going to hear me say the same thing again. That warty texture is stuck on appearing. It's very well demarcated. You can see where it begins and where it ends. And this is what I mean by somebody having tons of them on the, on the back, and nobody with melanoma is going to erupt into all of these. Now, sometimes we have to differentiate, um, when I look at a back that looks like this, what is a seborrheic keratosis and what's a mole. And then I look at the moles individually and decide if they look worrisome or not. But the background noise of all the seborrheic keratosis, you get a sense there's a lot of that going on and not a lot of other stuff. So very, I mean, I get this question probably 25% of a clinic day is, what is this? And, and then the question, I say it's benign, it's nothing to worry about. And then the next question is, what well, can I get rid of it? So insurance does not cover it. Uh, because it has no malignant potential, because it's completely benign, insurance does not cover it for it to be treated unless it's symptomatic in some way. And symptomatic can be itchy, painful, bleeding, inflamed, which means I can look at it and see there's a lot of redness within that seborrheic keratosis. Then I can go ahead and treat it and have insurance pay for it. Otherwise, it's a pay-out-of-pocket cosmetic thing because it's a benign lesion. If I'm not sure, if I'm looking at something and I can't decide if it's a seborrheic keratosis or something else, then that's a reason to do a biopsy, and that biopsy gets covered by insurance, because that's a diagnostic question. But if I look at something and I know it's benign, then it becomes a cosmetic issue to remove them. The most common way to remove them is to use liquid nitrogen. Who's familiar with liquid nitrogen, just so I get a sense? More than 50% of the room, yeah. So I will go over in detail what liquid nitrogen is, but it can, it's delivered either through a Q-tip or through a spray out of a, a um, what's called a cryac, which is like a, I call it my spritz gun. Um, and that um, produces enough cold to that area that the skin lesion freezes, and then when it thaws, the ice crystals break open and damage the skin so that eventually it becomes a scab and crumbles up and falls off. There are other ways to treat seborrheic keratosis, but that's the most common. Dermatofibroma. I see people complaining and concerning about, concerned about this very often. This is a firm, so it feels hard when you touch it. Dome-shaped, meaning that it's sort of like a dome. 
doesn't have a lot of surface change, so it's not warty. Um, it, it can, it's brown, so it has hyperpigmentation in, to, into it, and it's often at sites of a prior trauma, a minor trauma, like an ingrown hair or a bug bite. So people often come in and say, oh, I got a bug bite, but then it turned into this, and now this doesn't go away. Do I need to worry about it? Or I hadn't ingrown the hair there, or I had a pimple there. And so I explain the, what a dermatofibroma is um, by saying it's an exaggerated response to very minor trauma. It's on the spectrum of a keloid, which people are familiar with as being exaggerated scars. It's on that kind of spectrum. But these are individual lesions, in which case the trauma is felt to be so innocu innocuous it was almost forgotten. Um, so we don't treat these for the most part unless they're symptomatic, because if you treat them by removing them, you can imagine that there is a signal to make extra scar tissue in that particular area from a minor trauma. Now, if I biopsy or remove the spot, there's going to be that same signal again. So they tend to recur and be problematic. So we don't remove them, we reassure. But if they are bothersome in terms of hurting or itching, we can remove them through um, excising them completely or sometimes just injecting some steroids locally into the area with a little 30 gauge needle will help relieve the symptoms, but it won't take the spot away. So here's a dermatofibroma. It's very hard to capture in a 2D image what a dermatofibroma is because it has that firm quality to it that is very important to be able to recognize. So one of the things that we do is we pinch each side of that dermatofibroma, and if the lesion dimples, meaning kind of indents, that's a diagnostic tool that we use at the bedside to prove that some things are dermatofibroma. So that would feel very firm between your fingers if you were to pick it up. It's not necessarily that raised in some cases, and some it's very raised. Um, but then it pick, you sort of pick it up between your fingers and it indents, and that's called the dimple sign. So here's a pinker version of a dermatofibroma. And here's an example of that dimple sign. So in the middle here is the dermatofibroma, and the fingers here are pinching on either side of it, and you can see that it's sort of indenting. Do you get that? that um, hopefully that is coming across clearly. This is a larger dermatofibroma, so this might be a spot that I would consider doing a biopsy on or maybe have a differential diagnosis, which means a list of other things that it could be if I wasn't quite sure. This is not something that I would um, expect. Um, I would expect myself to think a little bit extra about this spot just because it's larger and it's got that pink center and there's some other things that can look like dermatofibromas and not be dermatofibromas. Cherry angioma. So I'd say that probably at around age 30 or so, uh, women more than men start to get these tiny little red spots, often on the trunk, sometimes on the arms and legs as well. And they don't know what they mean, and so they come in and ask the question, what is this? Again, this is a benign spot, has no clinical significance. It is not malignant or pre-malignant. You will get more of them as you get older, is always what I say. Um, and it, they are very bright red, sometimes a deep purple, but the earliest ones tend to be bright red. By not easily compressible, I mean you can't make it go away if you press on it. It's just kind of there, it's stuck there. Um, really, there again, it's a benign lesion completely, and so there's nothing that we do about it unless somebody doesn't like the way it looks or unless it starts to bleed. These are made up of uh, groups of blood vessels, so because of that reason, if they get traumatized, nicked by a bra strap, a fingernail, um, something, they can bleed, and for those reasons, we would remove it or, um, or treat it, but otherwise, they don't require treatment. So here are those cherry angiomas. And look, in the background are all those seborrheic keratoses. But the cherry angiomas have that bright pink magenta red, I think is a good color for it. Bless you. Um, and take a look and see these teeny tiny ones. You see those? So there could be thousands that aren't really noted to the, to the eye until you start to look around. Do you see all of these? These are all tiny little cherry angiomas and then the larger ones. And sometimes they get large enough that they become problematic. They are bumps that are, can be visible underneath clothing. Or for those kinds of reasons, they might require or um, become, it become necessary to remove, but we don't remove all of them. So sometimes, as I said before, they can be purple. So these are larger angiomas. Again, no clinical significance. 
and smaller individual lesions. This is on the extremity of a younger person. Okay, pyogenic granuloma. So this refers to um, an area of the skin that becomes traumatized and then develops exaggerated healing tissue. Healing tissue is called granulation tissue, and it, for some reason, we don't know why, but at certain sites of trauma, pa patients can get exuberant granulation tissue forming in that space as a healing reaction that's kind of over-exaggerated. The areas tend to be very friable, so they tend to sort of bleed very easily. They're kind of weepy and wet. They look because they're healing tissue trying to, oh, they're overworking healing, healing tissue, by the way. Um, happens in children and adults. It's pretty common in children. Treatment, these do require treatment because they're symptomatic. So even though it's benign, um, these are things that we do treat. In fact, I treated one today on the finger. And we, we treat them by removing them. So we shave biopsy, we shave, remove it off, and then we burn the bottom of it with a hyphricator, which I'll show you what that is um, as we move through the lecture. And that often will prevent it from coming back, but not always. It can recur even after being treated appropriately. So here's a pyogenic. <laughs> oh, I should warn you, there are going to be some gross slides. <laughs> it's dermatology. Um, so, so you can see how kind of wet that is. And, and so this is the healing granulation tissue. It often has a, what we call a collarette of scale. So around the edges, it's got some normal looking skin that's trying to heap up around it. And it's very weepy, wet, and very friable. So it bleeds very easily. Here's a very large pyogenic granuloma emanating off, I think this is the foot. And it's again that healing red granulation tissue. Another one off the nail, not uncommon to get them at sites of hangnails. It's not an uncommon response to somebody pulling off a hangnail. The, the tissue grows back in an exuberant way to try and heal. Chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis. So chondro means cartilage, dermatitis means inflammation in the skin, nodularis means it's a nodule, and helix refers to the helix of the ear. So actually everything you need to know about that condition is in its name. It is inflammation of the cartilage on the helix of the ear. That's all it is. But it is exquisitely painful. It almost always is a, um, a result of pressure. So somebody lying who habitually sleeps on the same side comes in and says, I've developed this really painful sore on the edge, on the, on the, on the helix, the, the, the outside of the ear, and it hurts whenever I put pressure on it. And it's been there for a while and it won't go away. And then I say, is that the side you sleep on? And they always say yes. So it's really, really common. We don't understand what triggers the, the um, cartilage to become inflamed when it becomes inflamed. It can mimic a skin cancer, so I have biopsied the short term for this is CNH. I've biopsied CNH several times to make, not, make sure I'm not missing a, a skin cancer. But often it's just about relieving the pressure. You can remove it with liquid nitrogen. That's what LN2 stands for. You can inject steroids into it. You can cut it out. But often that doesn't do very much. It's really about avoiding the pressure. So you can buy a CNH pillow. This basically creates a hole, or you can cut a hole in a, in a foam pillow. Basically what it does is it takes the pressure off the ear so that cartilage has time to heal. So this is CNH. You can see it's, it's a crusted bump. On the, this is the helix of the ear. So this kind of outer ridge of the ear is called the helix. Sometimes it's on this part of the ear, which is called the antihelix. Um, which is another inflamed, it can be another area of inflammation occurring in the cartilage there. And it's got a little crust on it, so sometimes it does bleed. When skin lesions bleed spontaneously and, um, and the skin cancer is in the differential or, the, or a skin cancer is a possibility for a diagnosis, that usually means I'm going to biopsy it. So this might be a spot I would think about biopsying. Here's another example. See that little crusted bump? CNH, chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis. And this one's a little harder to find, but there it is. They all start to look the same. The idea is to show enough pictures of things looking identical that you begin to recognize the pattern. Because as I said before, dermatology is all about pattern recognition. Sebaceous hyperplasia. Again, everything you need to know about this diagnosis is in its name. Sebaceous refers to sebaceous glands, and hyperplasia means overgrowth. So this is overgrowth of sebaceous glands. It, it tends to be um, in people who've had oilier skin. So 
I try and tell patients who complain that they have this, which is benign and cosmetic to treat, that it probably means they won't have as many wrinkles because they've had they have oilier skin. So there's the, there's the good side of that, um, and it tends to be multiple. Um, or single, pink to yellow bumps on the skin. They often form like a little grouping of the ye yellow bumps and in the center is a dell or an indentation. And then there's something called telangiectasias, which is visible blood vessels kind of traipsing through it. It can be a mimicker of a basal cell skin cancer. So this is something that people do come to me worried about and I'm, I'm happy to be able to assure them. It's another time that people say, well, I don't like it, can we remove it? Um, but again, it's benign and um, nothing to worry about. Treatment options include um, um, electrodesiccation, which is basically heat destruction. You can laser them off. You can remove them with a biopsy. You can do something called photodynamic therapy, which is blue light treatment, or cryotherapy, which is um, burning them off. So this is sebaceous hyperplasia. And I, hopefully, you can, do, you can see the little yellow bumps. They're pink to yellow. And they're kind of coalescing, so they come together. And in the center is that Dell. Everybody see that? OK. Here's somebody with more of them. They're kind of everywhere. And they all look exactly the same. Again, nobody's going to have eruptive basal cell skin cancers that all look identical. The difficulty for me is identifying in, some, in the background of this, is there a basal cell skin cancer hiding amongst the sebaceous hyperplasia? And a close-up ex close example of sebaceous hyperplasia, which is these grouped yellowish papules, a central del, and a little bit of telangiectasia. Now, as we get to basal cells, you'll see basal cells are pearly and pink as well, and they can, be, um, they can, they can overlap in some of their features with sebaceous hyperplasia. But it's that ring with the del in the center, and each one of the bumps that makes up that ring is yellow. That's very reassuring for sebaceous hyperplasia. OK, so we're going to move on to non-melanoma skin cancer. By non-melanoma skin cancer, there are many non-melanoma skin cancers, many, many. But the most common ones that we um, should all know about are actinic keratoses, which are sometimes called precancers, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. These are all induced by repeated ultraviolet radiation. When I say precancer for actinic keratosis, it's pre-squamous cell, not pre-basal. Um, just so that you understand which spectrum we're talking about. Okay, so let's start with actinic keratoses. This is this is due to in situ or in situ dysplasia. So dysplasia means abnormality in um, um, in sort of the lifespan of a cell. So when a cell becomes dysplastic, it means it doesn't. It's not. It's not regulated like it's supposed to be regulated. So it starts to do its own thing. And in this case, there's enough um, photo damage or, or ultraviolet radiation damage to that cell that the own built-in repair mechanisms can't repair that sun damage. So normally, when, we get, when the sun comes in and damages our skin, we have DNA repair mechanisms that go in and say, oh, that, that was an abnormality induced by the sun. I'm going to go and fix it. And the way I think about an actinic keratosis is that you've used, up all, you've used up all your cards, that there's been enough cumulative damage that it overrides the body's ability to fix that DNA damage. Does that make sense to everybody? And if you accumulate enough of that, you're an actinic keratosis. And if you're allowed to grow unregulated even more than that, you become a squamous cell carcinoma. And that's kind of how the, how it, the spectrum goes. That said, calling it precancerous is a little bit of an overstatement, because less than 1% per year goes on to become a skin cancer, a squamous cell carcinoma. And when it does become one, it's quite obvious. It grows rapidly. It bleeds. It hurts. So it's an, usually an obvious change as an actinic keratosis becomes a squamous cell carcinoma. So I don't want to get everybody worried if they have an, a precancer or an AK, which is what actinic keratosis AK is short for actinic keratosis, that they need to worry that they're going to then go on to have cancer. It's actually um, a very small percentage that go on to transform. Um, so the other question is, well, when did this happen? When did this happen to me? Is this something that I was, I was, you know, I hung out on the beach as a kid, and now I'm in my 60s, and 
Am I, is using sunscreen now gonna matter when we're talking about the cumulative damage from when I was a kid? And there's evidence to say that yes, continued use of sun protection and sunscreen does prevent continued persistent damage. So you might not be um, as well off as if you had never spent those first 18 years at the beach, but you're still better off than if you weren't using sunscreen at all. That's kind of how I think about continuing sunscreen use. So actinic keratoses feel, um, this is a clinical diagnosis, they, they are often red, sometimes red brown, sometimes just slightly pink, and they feel rough like sandpaper. So when I'm examining somebody's face, I'm often ha I have my hands kind of rubbing on their skin because I'm looking for that sudden change in texture where it feels sandpapery. Some people come in and they say, well, this spot kind of is tender a little bit when I touch it, and it feels flaky and rough, and then it seems to go away, and then it comes back. That's pretty classic for an actinic keratosis. And it's going to be in areas that are sun exposed. So in this person, you can see this is um, a gentleman's hand, and he has many actinic keratoses, and then they're starting to get really thick here. So you can see the difference between this lesion, hopefully, and this lesion here, and this lesion here. So this might be one that I would biopsy or watch more closely for transformation into a skin cancer, whereas more of what's going on in the background are actinic keratoses. Another very extreme example of many actinic keratoses, these are very obvious because you can see them, sometimes you can mostly feel them. So again, that scaly, sandpapery texture on a red base, this hand is covered in actinic keratoses, so it's really hard to see the normal skin, but here's a little bit of normal skin, but all these, you can see that the backs of the fingers are covered in the sun damage. So this might be what, a farmer's hand might look like, somebody who's in the sun all the time and doesn't really get many breaks from that chronic sun exposure. This is an example of what happens when a, an actinic keratosis develops into a squamous cell carcinoma. So the reason that I know that that's a squamous cell carcinoma is I can see that there is a growth developing from this part of the skin. Can you guys see that? That there's actually a dome developing. Before you see the scale, you can start to see that dome forming. And that dome formation is telling me that this is a nodule, it's actually a growth, not just rough and scaly. And that's what tells me that it's not just simply a precancer, but now we've evolved into something that is probably a skin cancer. So basal cell carcinomas is what we're gonna talk about next. These are the most common of all cancers, and lifetime risk for a Caucasian is up to 50%. So pretty much um, when people get worried that they've made one, I reassure them that I'm sure that 50% of their friends will also make one. Um, I also want to point out that if you're going to get a skin cancer, this is the one to get because it's, it's locally destructive, but doesn't tend to metastasize. So there are the rare cases, of course, where basal cell car carcinomas do metastasize, but it is very rare. I've personally never seen a patient with that. I do know of patients with that, but I've never seen anybody with that. Um, they tend to be more annoying and locally destructive. Again, induced by sun exposure or overexposure and um, they need to be treated because they're a skin cancer, but they don't change life expectancy. So that's something reassuring about them. So they're clinical subtypes, and the reason that I put this on here is because if you or a loved one or a friend or, um, develops a basal cell carcinoma and you're trying to understand why certain treatments were suggested for a particular basal cell carcinoma, it all has to do with the type of skin cancer that was found, basal cell that was found. And there are different subtypes of how things look to the eye, and there are also different subtypes about how they behave histologically. In other words, when you do a biopsy and you send that to the pathologist, the pathologist looks at the pattern and reads back to me, um, the dermatologist, what that pattern is. And certain clinical patterns and histologic patterns are more concerning and require more aggressive intervention than others. So that's why not all basal cells are treated the same. The other reason not all basal cells are treated the same is because of where they might be lo located. So for example, the skin on the side of the nose, that's, there's not a lot of skin there. You want to save as much as you can. But on the mid-back, a millimeter or two is not going to make that much of a difference. So you might choose how to intervene based on the location of the lesion. So um, let's talk about some, some clinical examples. 
So this is a nodular basal cell carcinoma. So um, nodular means that it, um, the, the, the histology is a, is a large aggregate or nodule of the basaloid cells that are making the skin cancer. Um, but it can also refer to the fact that it's a nodule on the skin. So everybody can hopefully appreciate that it's shiny and waxy. So when the light shines off of something on the skin, you can get a sense of whether or not um, what it's going to feel like by how that light is reflecting off the skin. So can you see the difference between how the light's reflecting off of this um, sun-damaged skin is kind of wrinkly and it's almost like little tiny stripes, where it's reflecting off of this, this is sort of smooth and shiny. Can you see that? Okay. So that's one of the features is a smooth and shiny, pearly look to it, and then these visible blood vessels that are called telangiectasias. Now, all cancers grow rapidly. Basal cells grow very, very slowly, but in broad, in broad strokes, cancers grow rapidly, and so it's not unusual for cancers to uh, outgrow their blood supply and start to bleed because they're not getting enough blood supply, so they start to necrose. And so sometimes in a skin lesion, you can see bleeding, and bleeding is a bad sign, meaning it could be a skin cancer because it could be that that skin cancer is outgrowing its blood supply. So um, hopefully on this example, you can see this pearly border. Do you, can you guys see that? Here's that also indentation like we were talking about for the sebaceous hyperplasia, but what's not visible is the yellow individual, is the yellow individual bumps coming together. Can you see how that's missing here? And this central dell is actually a dell because it's starting to necrose and become a scab rather than just an indentation. Does everybody see that difference? Okay, so those, that's a skin cancer, and there's another one sitting right there. So this one um, might just look like, at, at first glance, like a scaly spot on the skin, um, kind of not specific. But if you spend a little time looking at it, again, the light is shining in a way that can tell you it's pearly, right, and smooth. It's outgrowing its blood, su blood supply, so there's that spontaneous central scab crusting. And then it's got the telangiectasias. Here's another example. So one of the tricks in dermatology when your eye goes to where the action is, and, and, and here the action's all this hemorrhagic crust, so blood like a scab. Hemorrhagic crust just means a scab. Um, so where you can see all of that bleeding that is dried up, that's where your eye's going to go. But that's not telling you anything. That's just telling you that it's bleeding. But it doesn't tell you what the spot is. So you have to move off to the periphery and see if you can see what that spot is. So now if you look at this, this is the pearly rolled border, sometimes called in basal cell carcinoma. This whole thing is that basal, sorry, basal cell carcinoma. So you can kind of see it's pearly again, it's got visible blood vessels, and it's starting to spontaneously bleed. Okay, let's talk about some superficial basal cell carcinomas. So these are slightly scaly, slightly shiny. They don't go away. They're often pink, and they often can look like an actinic keratosis, but they don't have that rough feel to them, like sandpaper quality. So this just looks like somebody scratched themselves and it's healing, but then the history becomes important. Oh, that's been there for three or four months and just stays like that. So if somebody scratches themselves and gets a scab, the scab's gone in two weeks, three weeks. But if something's there for several months, then I lean towards biopsying it. So you can kind of, the history there is gonna be very important. A pigmented basal cell carcinoma means it's got all the other features of the basal cell skin cancer, but now it's got some brown in it. So when dermatologists say pigment, we're referring to brown color. And so brown color in anything that is a growth does make you think, at least I have to think about melanoma. So sometimes pigmented basal cell carcinomas can look like melanoma. In this case, it doesn't because it's only got one tiny little speck of pigment. Does everybody see that? And hopefully you can appreciate that there are three basal cell skin cancers on this slide. And hopefully you can appreciate the pearly rolled borders, and you can see the telangiectasia, and here you see the pigment. This is a deeply pigmented basal cell carcinoma right here. So you might say, well, how can I tell the difference between that and a seborrheic keratosis? Well, this patient's demonstrating that for you quite nicely, because here are the seborrheic keratoses. They don't have that pearly look to them, because they've got the warty texture. They don't make that shiny, waxy look when the light hits it. So that's number one. Number two is you can get a sense of the, of the red, brown, orange, brown discoloration there, 
when we're talking about the brown. Where we're talking about the pigment in a, in a basal cell carcinoma, it's more of a gray, waxy brown. And if you took away the pigment, hopefully you could still appreciate that where there were the ro rolled borders and that it's shiny and waxy and there are telangiectasias in there. Here's a really hard one. All you really see is the pigment. And here's another one. So these are pigmented basal cell carcinomas. Those are really tough. Here's a pigmented basal cell carcinoma that has all the features of basal cell carcinoma in the sense that it's waxy. It's got the telangiectasias. The only difference is, is there's a color. There's a brown color in it. Can everybody start to appreciate how this is very similar to other basal cell carcinomas? The only difference is the color. And then there's morpheiform basal cell carcinoma. Morphia is a type of um, skin condition where the skin becomes very hard and scar-like. So sometimes we use morpheiform when we're trying to convey that something is very hard um, or has tendrils in it that are sort of infiltrating and that then kind of bind everything down. That's what morpheiform means. And so it often will look like a scar and it'll be very difficult to figure out where it begins and ends. So again, you can find the features of a basal cell carcinoma. Here's that pearly border. But you can also get a sense that this is, this is lifting up the entire lip. It's actually eating away at the skin. Um, and it's sort of maybe ending up here, but you can't really tell. So morpheiform basal cell skin cancers are tricky because there are tendrils of the skin cancer that kind of travel underneath the skin, and that's what makes it feel so scar-like. And that also means they're harder to remove just by cutting them out because you can't really see where things begin and end. So you need to do something called Mohs surgery, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, moving on to squamous cell carcinomas. Um, so squamous cell carcinomas are more concerning than basal cell carcinomas. They can metastasize. They are still relatively easy to treat when caught early. I do have patients that have passed away from metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. But again, um, that's more because the skin lesion was let, left alone and allowed to propagate for a long period of time. Because when they're caught early, they're considered, they can pretty much 100% treated. They're often um, red, warty-like. Um, they may ulcerate because they are outgrowing their blood supply. The fairer you are, the more sun exposure you have had, the more um, high risk you are. And if you've had an organ transplant in the past, you're more likely to have um, a squamous cell carcinoma. And in the organ transplant population, squamous cell carcinomas are much more common than basal cell carcinomas and much more aggressive. So sort of an ill-defined, uh, scaly, I guess you'd say this is just a plaque sitting on the nose, that's a squamous cell carcinoma, and somebody who's had a lot of sun damage. And you can see that sun damage because there's red-brown discoloration, that's an actinic keratosis. There's lots of visible blood vessels and lots of brown and white, so there's been lots of sun-induced changes on the skin. This is another kind of squamous cell carcinoma where it almost looks like psoriasis because it's got that stuck on scale. And I had a patient just the other day who's been treated by a dermatologist for something that um, looked like psoriasis, but was just, it was actually a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So this is a very thin squamous cell carcinoma. It's called Bowen's disease. And it's a red plaque with overlying scale. This whole thing is a very thin skin cancer. This is a cutaneous horn. And underneath that cutaneous horn at the base is the squamous cell skin cancer. And you can kind of see it's eating away at the lip. This is a special kind of version of a squamous cell carcinoma called a keratoacanthoma, KA for short. It rapidly grows, so it develops um, its full size in about a month, and then often spontaneously involutes. And its classic sign is that it looks like a dome, and in the center of the dome is a bunch of scale. So can you kind of, kind of see that smooth domed edge and then like, it's almost like a volcano in the center is that kind of volcanic scale in the center. Um, and it comes on very quickly. So patients get very worried. And then often they'll spontaneously involute. If they don't spontaneously involute within a month of showing up, I treat them like a squamous cell carcinoma. It's kind of controversial. Are they benign and self-involuting, or are they a version of squamous cell carcinoma? Because some squamous cell carcinomas will look like this and persist, and then in that case, they're not keratoacanthoma. canthoma. So sometimes it's hard to know. So if the history is that they grow very, very rapidly and then start to spontaneously resolve, sometimes they just go away on their own and we leave it alone. 
Here's another example of a keratoid canthoma. It's a little bit of a blurry image, but you get a sense of that same dome shape on the sides and the central keratin core. All right, so let's talk about some treatments for the actinic keratosis, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. So liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen can be delivered in different ways. The first and most common way, I think, is the cryac, which is my little sp spritzer. Um, and it induces a freeze, which you're seeing there on your right. Um, and then when that freeze thaws, it's the ice crystals that kill the dysplastic cells or the precancerous cells. It's not the freezing that kills the cells. So it's really important that when it thaws, that the full thaw time is allowed to happen for the lesion to be adequately treated. Some practitioners use Q-tip dipped in liquid nitrogen. That's giving you that um, really scientific <laughs> picture. Um, looks a little bit like a science lab. But the, the Q-tip doesn't hold a lot of the liquid nitrogen in it. And so since the, d the, the degree of coldness and the depth of the freeze correlate to how well something's going to be treated, this often doesn't get deep enough um, to treat a lot of the things we're treating. So I find that this is not the optimal way to deliver liquid nitrogen unless I'm dealing with very thin lesion, a, a young child, because um, this is less painful than the, than the cryac, um, or a very sensitive area, like around the eyes. Um, I talked about another method of treatment called electrodesiccation. This is a method of, this is one of the tools we use in our often. This one's called the Hyfricator 2000. Um, basically, what you're doing is you're delivering high voltage current to heat damage skin. And um, by damaging the skin with heat, you therefore form a scab, and then when that scab crumbles off, falls off, crumbles up and falls off, it leaves healing skin underneath. So that's one way to treat skin lesions. So you can imagine that either liquid nitrogen or using electrodesiccation does not provide tissue to go to the lab for pathology to evaluate it. So often this is something that we use if we're dealing with a precancer, benign skin lesions, and we're just trying to get them off, but we know that they're benign, or we have a biopsy proven already what that spot is, and now we just need to treat the rest of it, and we know that this is a, a reasonable therapy for those kinds of skin lesions that we've biopsied. Um, but otherwise, if we're trying to make a diagnosis um, and treat, this is not the way to do it. Here's an example of how electrodesiccation is used. This is the seborrheic keratosis on the lip. So that's before treatment. During treatment, you can kind of see it starting to get a gray char at the superior portion where it's being treated, where the inferior portion has not been treated yet, so you don't have the gray char yet. And then it becomes friable, and then you use a gauze, you kind of rub it away, and then the spot's gone, and the healing tissue is underneath. So for specifically treatment, treatment of different individual lesions, I just wanted to throw this out there for you. So for actinic keratoses, the most common treatment is to use liquid nitrogen with a single freeze-thaw cycle. So I hold the cryac there, it's freezing for about five seconds or so, and then I allow it to thaw completely, and then that's one complete treatment. There are also topical treatments that are approved for use for actinic keratoses, and they range from um, chemotherapies like 5-fluorouracil to a miquimod, which is something that induces the immune system to come in and recognize the spot. Um, diclofenac is a non-steroidal, and Picato is a new option that um, is very difficult to get covered by insurance, but only requires three treatments, whereas the other ones require repeated longer-term therapy. Photodynamic therapy, who's here heard of blue light therapy? Some of you, so photodynamic therapy is basically a way of sensitizing the skin to the light by putting something on it that is a sensitizer and then shining a very specific light on the skin and then the precancerous treat, the lesions will light up and get treated because they're now sensitive to the sun. So whatever it is that you do, you have to know that it's going to look terrible as it heals. So an individual lesion being treated with liquid nitrogen is not so severe, but if you're going to treat multiple lesions or if you use any of these for field treatment, meaning I'm gonna treat an entire area of the face that has a lot of precancerous change and it's hard for me to identify an individual lesion, then you're gonna get really red and inflamed during treatment. So this is an expected and excellent result on the left with 5-fluorouracil therapy. You want this to happen or it's not working. 
So anytime a topical treatment is put on a precancer or a skin cancer, if you don't get inflammation like this, it's not working. So it's very uncomfortable to go through, it's very ugly, people don't wanna leave their home for a few weeks, but then afterwards you get a regeneration of a baby fine skin and almost like you're starting over. Not exactly starting over, but a lot fresher. Um, it's something to be aware of if, if a lesion that is thought to be an actinic keratosis is being treated appropriately for an actinic keratosis, but it still persists and it doesn't want to go away, it should be biopsied because that means that the damage, the dysplasia, the precancerous or cancerous change is deep, is deep and kind of throughout the skin and may indicate that you're actually dealing with a skin cancer and not a precancer. So basal cell carcinoma treatment is really um, determined by the location of the spot, the, the basal cell skin cancer, the size of the lesion, and the subtype, meaning the clinical subtype or the histologic subtype. So I've put here for you the, the um, accepted treatment options for different versions of of skin cancers. So for superficial basal cell carcinomas, which means that they're very thin under the microscope, you can use a cream, you can electrodesicate and then curate, curatage. So that basically means putting that heat machine on, then scraping that dead skin off, repeating the heat, scraping again, repeating the heat and scraping again. So it's done three cycles the same visit, right then and there. And after the last cycle, then you put Band-Aid on and you're done. Um, you can also cut out a superficial basal cell skin cancer, but that might be overkill, you don't have to do that for a superficial basal cell skin cancer. For nodular or pigmented basal cell skin cancer, you can do, these, these do not respond to creams, so the point here is an, a topical cream is not an option, but EDNC, excising, or doing Mohs surgery are, and then for some that are really difficult to treat or late stage, end stage, you might choose to do radiation. For morpheiform infiltrated or micronodular, and by infiltrative and micronodular, those are histologic findings the pathologist report back includes in it, and that is a clinical clue that you need to refer for either excision or Mohs surgery. Squamous cell carcinoma comes in two flavors, in, in situ or invasive. In situ means at the very top layer of the skin, and invasive means going deeper into the skin. So if it's in situ and it's very superficial, you can treat with creams, you can treat sometimes with liquid nitrogen, although that's not really recommended, and you can scrape and burn, which is the simple term for electrodesiccation and curatage. For invasive squamous cell carcinomas, they must be excised and must have most surgery, or have most surgery because they're invasive and they have a risk of metastasizing if not treated properly. Topical treatment of skin cancer is an option, when skin cancers are not invasive. So again, superficial basal cell skin cancer, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Um, but you don't ever treat one without knowing what you're treating first. So there, it does require biopsies done first. So why would you give topical treatment? Because maybe you have a superficial skin cancer in a highly sensitive area. Um, and patients would prefer not to have a surgical scar. That is an option. Imiquimod is an option, 5-fluorouracil is an option. Um, those tend to be the, the typical treatment regimens, although they can vary. So who's heard of Mohs surgery? Okay, about half of you. Mohs surgery is a way to specifically treat um, skin cancers, specifically usually basal cells and squamous cells. It's named after Frederick E. Mohs, so it's M-O-H-S um, after his last name. It has a very high cure rate, the surgeon is a dermatologist trained in Mohs micrographic surgery. And the idea is you remove only the skin cancer cells and as little as possible of the normal skin. And you confirm in the office that it's completely removed before you put the patient's skin back together. It's appropriate for tumors that are large, maybe if there's a little healthy, if there's little good tissue underneath, or so for example, a highly sensitive cosmetic area like the face, or if it's been treated before and then recurred. So what is Mohs surgery doing? So Mohs surgery is actually removing the visible tumor and everything around it, sort of in its complete stage. Then that tumor is brought into the, into the office of um, where it's cut by a tech, a Mohs tech at that time that you're sitting there in the waiting room with the bandage on the open wound and the tech is cutting this in, into slides, and the slide is then prepared and read by the person doing the surgery, not the surgery, that's the Mohs surgeon, who looks to see if there's any positive 
um, margins. And if the margins are positive, then they go back and just go to the area where the margin is positive and they take a little bit more. And then they look at that under the microscope. And so they go until their margins are completely negative and then they sew the wound back up. So it's not 100%, but it's as close as we can get to making sure that the spot is completely clear by the time the patient leaves the office. People who do most surgery are specially trained in most surgery. They have a special fellowship that they go through. I do not do most surgery. I send to colleagues who do for appropriate tumors that I find. So this is a highly sensitive cosmetic area, basal cell carcinoma. We want to keep as much normal tissue as you can imagine. So um, this is a spot that would go from our most surgery. I warn you, the next slide is very um, distressing, or will be for some. Um, this is a basal cell skin cancer. And there's no surgery that can take care of this. So this person would probably go for uh, radiation therapy. You can tell it's a basal cell skin cancer for several reasons. One is if this was a melanoma, it, this would be too big for the person to still be alive. It would be too severe. It's been slowly growing over time because it's been allowed to, to become this size. Um, it's also enucleated the eye. And the peripheral rim still has the features of a basal cell carcinoma, which is a rolled pearly border. I think that's the worst picture. So you made it through. Okay. So acquired nevi, which are, called, which are moles. So these are uh, universal. They're in areas of sun exposure. They do change for throughout life. The normal natural history of a mole is it starts out flat and brown. It raises up as you get older and starts to lose its color and then eventually goes away. So there is a natural history of raising and then resolving. So people often come in and say, this was a flat mole, but now it's raised. Do I need to worry? Fair question. But if the otherwise, the features of it are otherwise normal looking, then usually no, patients don't need to worry. The typical size is around five millimeter. We worry when people have larger lesions, more than 50, and a pattern where it's not in sun exposed areas. So here are just garden variety acquired nevi or moles. They are smaller than half a centimeter. Their color is uniform throughout. They all kind of look like each other. So that's another very good sign. When we're looking at, if I'm looking at somebody covered in moles, I'm looking for the ugly duckling. The one that stands out is different from the patient's typical mole. And that's the one we biopsy. Atypical moles are not cancerous. They're not precancerous, but they're a sign of somebody at risk for melanoma. They tend not to be in sun-exposed areas, tend to be larger, and tend, patients tend to have more than 50 of them. So patients like this should be seen by a dermatologist because it's up to us to figure out which are the atypical moles and which are the ones that actually represent a changing mole that could become a cancer. These are not um, pre-malignant. In other words, each of these individual lesions isn't as at risk, any more at risk than any other mole of becoming melanoma over time, but the patient is at increased risk for melanoma. Does that make sense? So just a question to throw out there for you. If you had to pick one of these, um, what's the most important prognostic indicator in a melanoma? In other words, what's the most important thing to know about a melanoma? Is it one, how long it's been there, two, how deep it is, three, whether or not it's ulcerated, three, the size of it moving radially, or five, the location? Okay, I've got some votes for duration. Any, any other votes? Uh, radial growth phase. Radial growth phase, okay. It's actually depth. Depth is the answer. So um, it actually, how deep it is tells us how invasive it is. And the depth of invasion correlates with prognosis. So that's the most important feature that we're looking for when we're doing biopsy. So a few statistics about malignant melanoma. So we're noticing that there are more cases being found over time, but overall deaths for melanoma have stayed pretty consistent. The lifetime risk of melanoma in the United States is 2.2%, with a five-year survival of around 91.7%, which to me means we're finding them earlier. There's better awareness, we're finding them earlier. We're saving more lives because people are more aware. So kudos to you for being here and wanting to be aware. Um, it's, I do think it's working. In terms of other, other cancers, uh, melanoma ranks five in um, the most common type of cancer. And it represents about 5.2% of all new cancers in the United States. The five-year survival rate by stage, and stage is determined by um, not only depth, but also if it's spread other places. 
So if you can keep a, if you can find a melanoma early where it's just in one place and hasn't moved anywhere and that movement is determined by how deep it is, you're going to do very well with a 98.5% five-year relative survival. So that's good. So basically the story is find it as early as you can. Um, when, patient, when, when melanoma has metastasized, the five-year survival rate is 20%. We do have new medications now that are working wonders, but still the idea is find it early. And then the percent deaths by age, it's highest in the 75 to 84 age group, so the median age of death is 70. But you can see that um, if we find it earlier in younger people, they do, they do better. Um, and this is another des description of sort of how patients are doing, that even though we're finding new cases, that if you compare the overall five-year relative survival, 2009 to 1975, people are living longer even though we're finding more melanomas. Again, just saying I think we're finding them earlier. So as I mentioned before, the diagnosis of melanoma, really the prognosis is dependent on the depth of the lesion, and that's called the Breslow's depth, and then whether or not the lymph nodes are involved, and that's often related to the depth. The critical number to know is 0.8 millimeters. So when I call a patient and I say, look, we found a melanoma, but here's the good news. It's considered a very thin melanoma. It's less than the 0.8 millimeter um, mark, which means that most of the time we cut it out, and I see you often to make sure you don't make another one, but chances that it's spread is very, very low. So we're really looking for that number. When the number gets to greater than 0.8 millimeters um, and is ulcerated, then patients often get offered a sentinel lymph node biopsy. That means that we put dye into the site of the melanoma, we see which lymph nodes take up that dye, and then those lymph nodes that have taken up that dye then get taken out and looked at under the microscope for evidence of spread to those lymph nodes. If it's spread to those lymph nodes, then the prognosis is different than if it hasn't. So who's at risk for melanoma? Patients with a lot of atypical moles who have more than 50 moles, red hair and freckling. If you have an inability to tan, so we, we call skin types one through six in dermatology with one being the fairest. I never, ever, ever can get a tan. I, used, I know I needed to hide from the sun when I was a kid because I would always burn no matter what I did. That's a type one. And a type six is I go into the sun and I immediately turn brown and I never get red and I never have problems with sunburns. Um, and it does often correlate to skin type in terms of pigment, how much pigment is in the skin. But the other way of saying this is the fairer you are, the more likely you are to have melanoma. A history of severe childhood sunburns, or patients with a first degree relative with melanoma or certain genetic mutations that make people predisposed to melanoma. So when patients come in and they say, well, my grandmother's sister had melanoma, it's less significant to me than if somebody said my sister had melanoma, because it's really the first degree relatives that I'm worried about. So what makes something a melanoma? Well, there, um, we'll go over specific features, but you're looking for something that's irregular. In other words, that it's, it's not even all the way around, that there are differentiations in color, right? There's a deep black and there's a brown here. The edges aren't smooth. It's not symmetric from side to side. Also remember that, that melanomas can appear in places people don't expect. So patients um, who are of um, Latin American, um, Spanish, uh, Asian, or African American descent, or any kind of, of heritage in that group are more prone to get melanoma on the hands and feet than in other areas. And so we have to remember that hands and feet and nails are important places to look for color change. Um, and so this is an acral melanoma, I mean occurring on the hands or feet. This is a melanoma because again, it has some of the other features, sort of that um, irregular border. But look at the different colors. When we see red, blue, gray, white, those are bad signs. So there's a lot of red along with brown. So red and brown should not be seen together. So once we see that, we know that we need a biopsy. Here's the mole. Remember I told you that what happens with the mole is it loses its color? So there's the mole that's lost its color, but there's the melanoma coming off of it. And hopefully you can get appreciate the white in there, the black in there, the gray, the irregular border. The other color to look out for is white. So you can see that this is the, this is the lesion, and it's lost its color in here and lost its color here. 
So why does it do that? That's called regression, and that's basically the immune system coming in and saying, something's here that shouldn't be here, and I'm going to come and take that something away. And so it starts to take away the pigment. And that's the immune system recognizing that this is bad. So it's a clinical sign that you're dealing with a bad skin lesion. So this is a lot of the features of melanoma. You've got black specks. You've got white. You've got an ill-defined border. You really can't see where things begin and end. Here's another example of acral melanoma between the toes. So a good dermatologist, when you see one, should be looking between your toes to make sure that there's no melanoma there. So what are the features of melanoma that we want to teach as the simple rules? So we look for the A, B, C, D, E's. So asymmetry. Two halves of the lesion are not the same, right? You divide it in half, and they're not identical on either side. B, the border, irregular, notched, or vague would suggest melanoma. Color, you want to, um, so sorry, there's the, here the, the sort of, see that little notch? Like a little, it's almost like a little uh, lightning strike coming off. That shouldn't be there. That makes this a suspicious lesion. Color, so red, white, blue, black, gray, those are things we don't want to see. You can see a lot of that in this lesion, right? Besides the black, which is very scary, there's some white in there, and there's some pink in there. So those are things we don't want to see. Diameter, this is the weakest predictor of melanoma. So six millimeters is the rule, which is the size of a pencil eraser. But remember, melanomas can come from a mole or can come out of nowhere, just start up as a melanoma. And when they do that, they start small. So not everything that's a melanoma has to be large. But um, a new large lesion or one that stands out as larger than others should call your attention to that spot. So this is larger. This is, this is the ruler on the bottom. And these are centimeter markers. And clearly, this is larger than six millimeters. Also, look at that pink. Can you everybody appreciate that pink and white? So that's telling you it's, it's bad. And then lastly is changing over time. So that's the most important sign to me when a patient comes in and says, this is not what it used to look like. I have to pay attention to that, because that's a concerning sign for melanoma. So this is somebody who's getting mapped for her melanomas over time. There's almost nothing detectable on 3A. 3B, there's a new lesion. 3C, there's a lesion, that lesion's growing, and it's evolving into something that you can see has features of melanoma. So that's changing over time. So dermatology loves to throw curveballs. Everything has a curveball. And the curveball here is something called amelanotic melanoma. M melanin is what gives a melanoma pigment. If a melanoma lacks the melanin, it's not going to have any pigment. And so it's going to look pink and more like a squamous cell or a basal cell and can fool us when it's an, an, and be melanoma, but doesn't have a lot of the clinical features of melanoma. So just when you're starting to get comfortable, dermatology makes us uncomfortable again because it throws out the rare, um, the rare lesion that doesn't listen. So this is amelanotic melanoma. It's red. It's scaly. It's got some pigment in it. So when I'm looking for something that is a melanoma, but not classically melanoma, I'm always looking for a tiny bit of pigment. Because basal cells can make some pigment, so then I'm bi biopsying that anyway, because I'm thinking it's a pigmented basal cell. Squamous cells shouldn't make pigment. So if I see pigment in something that's otherwise red, then I know that that shouldn't be there, and that ne at least needs a biopsy. I'm throwing this in there so you are aware of it. We have new therapies for advanced um, skin cancer. So for basal cells, we've got vismatogib. So for the rare metastatic basal cell, or, or for patients who have heavy, heavy load of basal cells, or maybe that gentleman whose face was eaten away by the basal cell, this might, that might be a, a drug to try. And then a bunch of um, what can be best categorized altogether is immunotherapies for, for melanoma that are now being used and um, have great efficacy for many patients who had no treatment 10 years ago. So you may have heard that aspirin can prevent melanoma. Studies are still inconclusive, so nobody's really recommending aspirin for melanoma. Um, if you take an aspirin for another reason and you also have a risk for melanoma, it might help you. But we're not recommending aspirin to prevent melanoma at this point. Maybe blood pressure medicines can increase the risk of skin cancer. So there's new evidence coming out that the drug, um, the hypertension medicine hydrochlorothiazide, has been associated with a higher risk of specifically non-melanoma skin cancer. And that's because it's a photosensitizing medicine. So what does photosensitizing mean? It makes you more sensitive to the sun, more likely to burn when you go in the sun. So it's going to make you more susceptible, theoretically, then, to sun-induced um, 
damage to the skin. And so it is being shown in some early data that hydrochlorothiazide, pa patients on hydrochlorothiazide have a higher risk of skin cancer. Nicotinamide, 500 milligrams twice a day, can help prevent skin cancers in a very high risk population. That's the farmer with multiple skin cancers, or the organ transplant recipient, or I had a patient today who loves to sail and she's covered in more than I can count. I'm gonna put her on nicotinamide. Nicotinamide is a vitamin. Um, it's a, you might think, you might have heard of niacin, which is a blood pressure medication and a cholesterol medication. Um, niacin is, gives you a flush, Nicotinamide is in the same family, but doesn't cause a flush, so it's better tolerated. It does not affect cholesterol or blood pressure, um, but it can help you stop making skin cancer. So that's a nice vitamin to think about taking if you want to take a vitamin. Okay, sunscreens. I think a lot of, um, there's a sunscreens, there's not a lot of good information on sunscreens, so I, I find that people go to whatever source they could find to get the information. So I'm gonna give you the nitty gritty on sunscreens. So why do people use sunscreen? Well, clearly to prevent skin cancer, to prevent photosensitivity, meaning maybe your medication, like hydrochlorothiazide, makes you sensitive to the sun, so you need to protect your skin better. Doxycycline is a common antibiotic that makes you sensitive to the sun. Um, or maybe you have a skin disease, or an underlying disease that makes you more sensitive to the sun, like lupus might be a reason to use sunscreen. Why do I use sunscreen? The last one. And I find that's actually the most motivating for people to use sunscreen because um, it's the real reason that a lot of people uh, will, will put something on their face that they didn't before. So new sunscreen label, labeling came out in um, 2012. And it's important to understand what it means when you're looking at a sunscreen label. So first of all, SPF refers to UVB blockade. And the two different rays that we're blocking, UVA and UVB. UVA are the aging rays. They're also the rays that, that give you reactions to medications. UVB are the burning rays. UVA rays are the ones that come through windshields, windows, um, that still will age you even though you're inside. Um, UVB is often protected um, by, by the glass, but UVA is not. So when somebody says, I'm using an SPF sunscreen of 50, it's referring to how much UVB blockade they're getting. So you have to look at the ingredients to know how much UVA blockade you're getting, because there's no actual measure for UVA blockade. So sunscreens now have to say broad spectrum if they block both UVA and UVB. So you must buy a sunscreen that says broad spectrum if you want to prevent aging as well as burning. To, for a sunscreen to say it can prevent skin cancer and sunscreen, uh, sunburn, it has to be broad spectrum and be SPF greater than 15. And there's no longer waterproof or sweat proof. It's actually truly the way it's measured, water resistant for 40 minutes or 80 minutes, meaning that after 40 minutes of water exposure, does it still work? Or 80 minutes of water exposure, does it still work? Um, but the way I interpret that is you always have to reapply after every hour and a half or every two hours, because no matter what you do, it wears off. And there are different kinds of sunscreens. There are chemical sunscreens and physical sunscreens. And different ones are good for different things. So chemical sunscreens absorb um, UV. And these are great because they are very elegant. They've been formulated beautifully now so that you don't really know that they're on. They have a very light feel to them. The common names are benzophenone or parcel 1789 or maxoral. They're photo-unstable, which means they degrade after being in the sun. So you can't, your chemical sunscreen is not going to work after two hours of putting it on. In other words, you put it on in the morning before you go out for your day, at noon it's not working anymore. So you do have to reapply. There are some stabilizers that are in sunscreens, but the stabilizers don't really give you that much more time. They might give you a couple more hours. They say five hours. I still think that's generous. Physical sunscreens scatter or block UV, UV rays and are thought by many people who prefer not to use chemicals as sort of the safer option. And that's zinc and titanium. These are more photostable. They do block UVA very, very well, but they also are much more inelegant. These are the ones that tend to leave you white or chalky. 
they've made them better over time, but still I think that until it really soaks in, it still leaves you a little bit white and chalky. So what about coral reefs and sunscreens? So the sunscreens that we know need to be um, avoided and other ingredients within them to be avoided, so the benzophenone, which is oxybenzone, and that also tends to be one of the ones that commonly causes rashes and allergies. Butylparaben, which is a preservative, octanoxate, which is an ingredient, which is a sunscreen ingredient, and 4-methylbenzylidine, which is a camphor, and not allowed in the United States anyway. Um, for what you can use are water-resistant sunscreens that are um, biodegradable and sun-protective clothing and zinc. So zinc is pretty safe to use. Um, when I put this slide together, there was also a question of whether or not you could use titanium, but it's zinc is the safer, safest option. How to apply your sunscreen. So most people don't put enough sunscreen on. So when studies are looked at, and they, people say, well, I put on my SPF 100, why is it not working? It has to do with the amount of sunscreen going on the skin. So it's all about the application of sunscreen. So we tell patients to use uh, sunscreen every morning before they leave their house, at least 20 minutes before the sun exposure. For heavy sun exposure, like I'm at the beach or I'm golfing or I'm outdoors, then reapply 20 minutes after you go out, and then every two hours, or after swimming or sweating liberally or towel drying. And then remember how much to apply. So one ounce, a shot glass, covers a whole adult body, and that coverage lasts for two hours. The normal Neutrogena bottle of sunscreen is three ounces. So when people have a bottle of sunscreen for the summer, that's why it's not doing anything, it's because they're not using enough. So let's say you take a beach vacation to Hawaii and you're out all day and you're, and you're not using a rash guard and you want to know how much sunscreen you should be using, it's probably one bottle a day. Right. <laughs> um, antioxidants in sunscreen. So there's probably really no benefit to take, um, to add antioxidants to sunscreens. Some people ask about nanoparticles and are they safe if they're in sunscreens? And nanoparticles are zinc and titanium. Zinc and titanium are, co are coated when they're in sunscreen and so they don't penetrate into healthy, intact skin. So this doesn't apply to the person who maybe have a full body rash and then put sunscreen on that. That will probably get absorbed. But in healthy, intact skin where the barrier is normal, it's pretty safe to use zinc and titanium without worrying about nanoparticle absorption. What about melanoma and sunscreen use? Just to throw it out there and just so you know, that the people who claim that the sunscreen industry is promoting melanoma and that sunscreen promotes melanoma and that vitamin D is good and you should get it from the sun are all the tanning bed industry. The tanning bed industry is as bad as the smoking tobacco industry for promoting untruths and getting people to do things out there that they shouldn't do. There's no good UV rays. That's you know when tanning beds say, we, we only have the good rays. This such thing as only good rays. Um, and so you have to understand where a lot of that data is coming from. So we do have data that shows that melanoma decreases, um, that sunscreen is, decreases the risk of melanoma. And this was a study that looked at um, childhood sunscreen and, and lifetime sunscreen use, and it was significantly associated with a decreased risk of melanoma. And what about the question of what number should I get? A lot of people say, well, I've heard anything above 30 is no different. And a recent study just came out, it's a, in, in May of 2018, that was a split face study. So half the face got 50 and half the face got 100. And the side of the face that got 100 did better than the side of the face that got 50. So the higher the number, the better. But also remember, people generally don't put on what they're supposed to. So the higher number, if you, put in, if you buy the 100 and you put it on, okay, you might be getting your 25 or 30, right? If you buy your 100 and you put it on just right, you will get 100. What about vitamin D? Um, so typical sunscre sunscreen use does not affect vitamin D levels. You really have to be entirely protected um, and never go out to have your vitamin D go down. And that tends to be for people who have sun-induced skin conditions that completely avoid the sun 
or organ transplant recipients who completely avoid the sun. And the AAD, American Academy of Dermatology's position statement is there's actually no amount of safe sun, sun exposure to get vitamin D that can be recommended, because we can't tell you what safe sun exposure is. And so you should be getting your vitamin D from your diet, not sun. So in summary, non-melanoma skin cancer is common. Treatments are done in the office and are generally based on the type of skin cancer you have. Melanoma, finding it early is critical, and sunscreen, put on a high SPF, a lot of it, and often. So I think we've got plenty of time for questions. I appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to answer anything you may have. Yes, up in the back. Yeah, uh, for those of us that swim, um, we see signs up at the pool about put it on 20 minutes before you go in. I have to admit, you know, I go out there and there's sunscreen there, I put it on and I do go in the water. Mm -hmm. Is that a major mistake? And the second question is, are there certain parts of the body as we age, because of the sun, I'm speaking strictly sun, that tend to get more melt more possibilities of melanoma? Such as the scalp. Okay, so we'll start with the first question, which is um, I put my sunscreen on and then jump in the pool. So it does turn out that you need some kind of chemical reaction and absorption, uh, depending on whether you use a chemical sunscreen or a physical sunscreen, for your sunscreen to become effective. So putting it on and jumping in the pool doesn't allow it to actually penetrate and do what it's supposed to do. So you really should put it on and wait a while for it to get there to do its job. About how long? 20 minutes. Okay. Um, and the second um, question was, is there areas of the body that are, people are more predisposed to? So it's not really based on um, age as much as it's based on sex. So men tend to get their melanomas on their back, and women tend to get it on the backs of their calves. And that's not um, for any other reason, I think, than um, those are areas that were exposed but go kind of unrecognized in how much they're exposed. So think about little boys running around outside of the pool and they're not having shirts on um, and they don't wear rash guards. At that time, now we are seeing kids more in rash guards. And so that tends to be an area that doesn't get looked at very often, women wearing shorts or skirts, having their legs exposed and not thinking about it as much. Yes? Could you address laser treatments? I know a lot of people are addicted to getting them, and long-time repetitive use of laser treatments on skin? The question is long-time repetitive use of laser on the skin. You mean, is it any danger in terms of cancer development? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, the, uh, in fact, we use a lot of uh, light-based therapies to treat precancers and skin cancers. So that's the blue light or the photodynamic therapy. Um, and we use a lot of laser lights to treat sun damage. They don't increase your risk of cancer. Yes? Does sunscreen degrade if you don't go outdoors? Like if I put it on at 9 in the morning, stay in the house, go out and let it swim? OK, so, so what happens if it's um, if my sunscreen over the two hours, if I'm not outside. So UVA is, tends to be what degrades sunscreen, and UVA is through everywhere. So, so time and fo being photo unstable, meaning once it's out of the tube, it's not stable anymore. Yeah. Yes? Is there a time of day when the sun is out after which you don't need any sunblock? Is there a time of day after which the sun is out that you don't need sunblock? The right answer to that is no, um, that if the sun is out, you need some sunblock. The riskiest time is between 10 and 2. Um, so it's basically short sun, sh short shadow seek shade is the way people look at that. Um, that said, if uh, the sun is less harmful at other times, it's just not, not harmful at those other times. Yes. Yes. Is there a sequence when you apply moisturizer and you know and, and, and tan lotion? Is there a sequence? Okay, so what's the sequence between sunscreen, moisturizer, et cetera? So, so whatever the medicine is that I want to go onto my skin, the most is the one I put on first. So sunscreen goes on first, and then I can put my moisturizer with sunscreen on top of that. Those numbers don't get added. For example, if I put 50, SPF 50 on my face, and then I put my moisturizer, which has 15, I don't get a 65. Um, but but it, I, I do get a little added benefit. But I put the sunscreen on first, and then the moisturizer on top of that. If you're putting on a medicated treatment regimen, for example, if you're using Retin-A at night before you go to bed, um, and a moisturizer so you don't get dry, use the Retin-A first, followed by the moisturizer. 
Yes, another question. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about um, survival rates and so forth. Okay. Um, you were saying that children tend to survive better than adults. Is there some reason why? Um, I think what all that, that the question is why why is this, why does it seem that that graph is showing that the ch that children survive better than adults? I think what that's trying to show is that we're able to find it earlier. Um, we're, able, we're finding the melanoma earlier, and because we're finding it earlier, the survival is better. It's skipping that point. Yeah. Yes. Um, if we don't have any specific concerns, how often should we see a dermatologist for a general skin check? check? And what does a good check look like? Okay, so if you don't have anything of that you're specifically concerned about, how often should you see a dermatologist? Um, so if you have more than 50 moles, you should see a dermatologist at least yearly and then ask the dermatologist how often you should come in. If you've ever had a precancer, an actinic keratosis, you should probably see a dermatologist. If you've got a positive family history of melanoma, you should see a dermatologist. And at that visit, you will kind of establish what is my need after that. If you've had a lot of significant sun exposure, sunburns as a kid, ever used tanning beds, which we know increase the risk of melanoma, um, any severe blistering sunburns, lots of re repeated sun exposure, like I grew up on a beach, you should, you should definitely see a dermatologist to help determine how often you should go. What does a good skin check look like? Um, good lighting um, is important, and um, I believe, I, I try to do the same thing in every patient so that I don't leave anything else. I start at the head and I go down to the toes, and I start in the scalp, I look at the face, I go to the back of the ears, um, the chest, the back, um, then the patient lies back and I do the abdomen, arms, armpits, hands, um, groin, legs, feet between the toes, flip over, do the back again, back of the ears, buttocks, between the butt cheeks, um, back of the legs, bottom of the feet, between the toes. Mucosal exam is good to do um, as well because you can get melanoma inside the mouth. Anybody who's had a melanoma should see ophthalmology as well regularly because um, you can make melanoma in the eye called ocular melanoma, so that's important to look at as well. And ideally, you go to the dermatologist without nail polish so they can see the nails and make sure that there are no streaks of color in the nails. Yes? You mentioned the use of nicotinamide uh -huh. for the woman who was a sailor. Mm -hmm. um, would niacin be a suitable substitute for that, or would that not have the same effect? Um, that's a good question. I, niacin wasn't studied, so I can't say it's got the same effect, and it does have the flushing, it's the flushing um, symptom, so I can't say it's the same. Um, it's a different version of the same thing. Um, when we use um, the niacin derivatives in dermatology, we use nicotinamide um, or a derivative of nicotinamide, but not niacin. My guess is yes, but it wasn't studied, so I can't tell you for sure. Yes, a few more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned keloids once, yes. and I was not sure. Uh, is there some association or risk <laughs> of keloids with uh, anything you mentioned or okay. other skin disorders? Okay, so are keloids associated with anything to worry about? Generally speaking, not. Um, there are some things that can mimic keloids that are weird, like um, an infection you can get from bottled nose do dolphins, but that's very esoteric. But otherwise, keloids are not associated with anything to be, of con to be concerned about, and they don't go on to become cancers. Yes? Could you explain what it is about outgrowing a blood supply that causes um, a carcinoma to bleed? Okay. Um, so why does when something outgrow its blood supply does it bleed? Because if you can't get blood to something, it starts to die and necrose. And as things necrose, they become black and crusty, and, and they do start to bleed a little bit because you start to necrose deeper into the areas where there are blood supply. Um, so it's a little bit counterintuitive that if you don't have blood going there, why would you bleed? But really what I'm trying to say is that if something is growing so rapidly that the, the f you can't feed it anymore, it will start to die and necrose, and as it starts to die, it will start to necrose down into areas where there will be some blood, and then you'll start to see some bleeding. Yeah. Um, my husband has this, what appears to be a freckle that keeps getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. It's not raised. It's just a, a browner color of his skin, and it's on the side where the 
light shines in when you drive. So I obviously, well, you should have a doctor look at that. Oh, I don't need to do that. So it's a regular shape, but it's not raised at all, and it just looks like a big dark area of skin. Are those common? So the question is a, an enlarging pigmented spot that is not raised in a sun exposed area. In somebody above 60 or so, I would guess? Okay, so it's a good question because um, some sunspots are just benign sunspots and they can, they can be there and kind of appear out of nowhere. But if they're changing and growing, that is a concern. And so you can tell him a dermatologist that he should have it checked. Okay. <laughs> All right, one more question and then I think we have to, we have to end. Yes, sir. Uh, two more and then we'll be done. Okay. Okay, so what is a liver spot? So those spots that are induced by the sun on the back of the hands that are just sun spots that are not cancer, those are liver spots. Yes? Um, so with the A, B, C, D, E thing, that's something I've seen before, but I've never really seen anyone specify, is it all of those need to be happening to be worried, or if one of them is happening is enough, or if it's three, okay. or one? So is there a number that makes you more worried? Uh, the more positives you have on that list of A, B, C, D, E's, the more concerned you should be, but if any of them are there, it's something that you should pay attention to. All right, thank you everybody for your attention. Enjoy your evening.